Hello and welcome to the April edition of Table Football Monthly, incorporating lockdown edition number four. Now, first off, I, I want to make a quick apology. This edition has been later than any other in our history. Um, I won't rattle on about it. We're all going through the same difficult times and it was just a combination of those. But in addition, and on a more positive note, there's been such a heavy level of detail put into today's features that the edit has taken an age. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Now, before we go any further, I've got to do a shout out for Stuart Robinson. He wrote to me a week and a half ago, and like many of you do, and I absolutely love it, he wrote me an email talking about the old days, how we got into the game, how things had evolved. And he mentioned that his grandfather was a spray painter. And as part of his job, he painted the put a tiger in your tank logo on the back of SO tankers. And that he remembered this SO giveaway of foil team badges. And he wondered, having seen all the stuff around the back of the studio, uh, if we had a version of it, and if so, could he see it? Stuart, it's my pleasure, both for you and in respect for your grandfather's great work. I love those old SO tankers. You know what, as we're lazing about through this coronavirus pandemic, why don't we, before we get into the heavy and sweaty, meaty part of the program, have a little meander around days gone by at some of these other fantastic giveaways. She says it looks like rain as she gathers in who watching the postman on his round Calls out her name Cracks a joke And she is laughing A distant church bell chimes It's inevitably raining On shiny cobbled stones Down the alleyway Broken glass and fag ends, the factory siren calls. The day shift ends, nervous young men meet their girlfriends. Somewhere a baby cries, it's inevitably raining on shiny There is nothing I like more than a slow meander through football memorabilia. 
Thanks for the email, Stuart. That brought back an awful lot of memories. Now, it may look like I'm sitting around here doing nothing more than playing with toys. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm actually creating a little bit of mischief in relation to today's quiz. And this isn't a clue. I finally found a home for my football pinball machine. How cool is that? I spent ages restoring it and now it has moved to its rightful place in the studio. Now the reason we're standing here is of course because it is draw time and we have two competitions that we are drawing for today. The first one goes back, what seems like ages now, to our March edition of Table Football Monthly when we asked you to name these four England players from left to right. Those of you who have made it into our floodlighting box will have said Paul Mariner, Kevin Keegan, Gary Birtles and Brian Robson. We had a few Peter Withs, understandable. We had a few Tony uh, Woodcocks, equally understandable, and a couple of Kenny Sansoms. But anyway, I can't remember how many of you got the right answer, but it's a few, I can't pick you all up. You're all in here anyway. So what I'm going to do to pick a winner, and remember, the winner gets the Astro Base starter set, a fabulous prize, and you are gonna love it. So what I'm gonna do, Let's get them all floating about. Let them all travel to the bottom of the box. Right, we just want to take one out. The winner of the Astro Base kit, and I've got a feeling we've got our first ever two-time winner. I believe, Mr. David Croucher, you have won one of our prizes before. Congratulations. <laughs> Right, our second draw comes from last week's question, set by Paul Lloyd. The question was, what player in the 1974 Germany World Cup wore a different strip to the rest of his teammates? It was Johan Cruyff, of course, because of a sponsorship dispute. And I have to tell you, it created a massive, an avalanche of a response. Broke all table football monthly records by quite a long way. So we won't be letting Paul set another question because it took me half a day writing all the names down and slicing them all up. Thanks, Paul. But I think one of the reasons it generated such a response is Paul's exceedingly generous gift. He has offered the four best place sides from the 1974 World Cup final. And they are, of course, West Germany, Holland, Poland, and Brazil in Paul's unbeatable painting topspin style. So, we're going to do that draw now using the pinball machine. There are 122 of you, 122 of you in the cake baking tin from all over the world. We've had our biggest entry from Italy this month, France, Portugal, Spain, America, Canada, Australia, South Africa, to name but a few. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna stand in front of the door so I can't see. I feel so bad, there are so many of you in here. I would love to be able to pull every one of you out and send a Paul Lloyd, Lloyd team to all of you. This is it, I've got one. Oh dearie, dearie me, I'm gonna make, let me make sure it's just one. Feels like two, it is two. Right. Oh, this time we have a new winner. You don't really wanna know who it is, do you? Right, the anticipation, are you ready? The winner is, if you can see that, the winner is Andy Jones. Well done, Dave, and well done, Andy. I will be in touch with you in the next day or so to organize delivery. Right, there will be another quiz later on in the program uh, for a rather groovy prize again. But this time, I am setting a question that will not require a simple key into Google. Oh no, this time you're going to have to work for it. But I think you're going to like it. Okay, so don't go away. That quiz will be happening later on. 
Let's move on now and do a bit of table footy. If you saw last week's lockdown edition, you may recall we did a big feature on lightweights. And thank you to everybody who sent in such kind comments about it. The day after we'd uploaded it, Paul Lloyd got in touch. And he said, do you know why heavyweights are heavyweights and lightweights are lightweights? And I must admit, up until that point, I had never given it a moment's thought. It was just one of those things that is. There were heavyweights, there were lightweights. There were zombies, there were walkers, you know, it was just one of those things. But of course, once somebody mentions it, you want to know the answer rather badly. And if you've watched Table Football Monthly a lot, you'll know one of my favorite things is linking the history of tabletop football to social and cultural history. So, and the answer is spectacular and right up my street. Those of you old enough will remember that the 70s was a decade of turbulence, most of it caused by disputes between the governments, various governments, and the miners' union. That culminated in a three-day week where we just didn't have enough energy to go round. The raw materials became more and more expensive. Now, the heavyweights came out in 67 and ran up to 77. And the heavyweights were stuck in the middle of this dispute, their base being a coal-based plastic. As we moved into the 80s, the situation leveled itself out a bit. There were other issues going on in the country, but the energy issue began to sort itself out. We had North Sea oil coming in, but the prices of the raw materials, coal in particular, had shot up. So when the lightweights came out, a lot of companies involved in plastic manufacture, including Subutio Sports and Games, made the lightweights out of an oil-based plastic, which was lighter and less expensive. So the difference between the two wasn't an internal decision at Subutio Sports and Games to think, you know what, enough of those heavyweights, let's make something lighter. It was a commercial necessity. And that got me thinking, particularly about player types, which is something we're going to look into now. A lot of us Subutio folk are quite vehemently defensive of our favourite player type. You'll get the people who play with the cardboard and celluloid flats saying this is the only way to play. This is pure Subutio, the best figures uh, Peter Adolf ever created, beautifully balanced with a 25 millimetre ball. It's the only way to play and there's a lot to be said for that. Then there are people like me. I'll be backing the heavyweights, saying this Charles Stadden devised uh, player perched upon the base is the most realistic and most iconic base there is. And I like the heavy feel of the players. Then you'll get the lightweight generation looking at you and saying, I wasn't born then. I've only known lightweights. Nothing wrong with lightweights. I've used them all my days. And then you'll get the folk using the non subutio based newer, highly detailed, beautifully decaled uh, players on flat sliding bases saying, really, you're not still stuck in those cobwebby days of spin to win. And we defend that position with a real stubbornness. And I got to thinking, particularly after last week, I showed all my lightweight teams. They took up two tables and this rack behind me. I hadn't touched them for the best part of 30 years. And when I was filming last week, I was looking at them thinking, what a waste of time and money. Then during that episode, I was using them for a couple of days and I suddenly realized these are good. They not only look good, they play well. I've just got to retune my ears to the lighter click they make when they hit the ball. And I started thinking, player types, particularly in the uh, OO plastic era from 1961 right up to the end of the 20th century, aren't really that different. You have a player type, sometimes of a different shape or a different height, based, uh, stood upon a very similar plastic base with a weight in it. And I wonder if this focus on individual player types is a little bit of a myth, because if you practice the basic skills of Subutio, to flick, to spin, to learn your angles, 
then surely you can adapt and enjoy playing with any type of player. And that's certainly been the case for me since I've been doing this program. So we are going to launch into a really special feature. We're going to set eight different player types from the OO uh, scale 61 to the end of 20th century era. We're going to use some newer ones that are derivatives of heavyweights and lightweights. So eight different teams on eight different tables with different pitches and different balls to see if a single player type stands out or if you've got a basic skill to play the game, whether you can adapt very quickly to playing with any of them. And whether or not that debate interests you, the very least you'll get out of it is quite a few minutes of Subutio footy. It was over 90 years ago that Bill Keeley created new footy, the father of the tabletop football we all play today. 1929 that was. In the British general election of that year, women were allowed to vote. It was only two years since the first talking movie, The Jazz Singer. The biggest selling car in the world was the Ford Model A. And the Division I title winners were a club known as the Wednesday. They changed their name to Sheffield Wednesday the following year. So we're talking a long time ago. But for we Subutio hobbyists, we tend to focus on the era 1961 to the end of the 20th century. OO scale plastic figures playing to the key Subutio taglines of flick to kick and spin to win. Now, if you're a player who prefers the flats era from New Footy and Subutio in their early days, or you're a player who likes the more modern, flat-based, pro-based sliding players, then you're not being ignored. Both of those topics are big enough to deserve a feature of their own, and that will be coming. But for today, we're focusing primarily on lightweights, heavyweights, and their derivatives. Now, interestingly, in the 21st century, several companies have entered the fray, producing player types based upon these iconic figures. Companies such as Astrobase, Santiago, Topspin, and Zugo. Um, and I politically correctly did those in alphabetical order. So I have grabbed all those player types in, mixed them with the Subutio originals, spread them on several tables, and we're gonna have a little play. Now, I never want this to be a program that does top tens or the best of, or where my uh, opinions are a core part of the program. That's not really the way I'm built. What I hope we'll do is give you a chance to have a look at the various player types, also to have a listen to how good and chunky the bases sound when they hit the ball, how good the finishes are with the various players, and hopefully it'll either confirm your current taste or you may see something you fancy having a go with. So let's get on to table one. Here we have Brazil on their heavyweight bases and Argentina on the lightweight. Brazil coming in at two grams and Argentina lightweights at one. Before we allow these two South American titans to enter into battle, we have established, albeit on my very basic kitchen scales, that our 60s heavyweight Brazil at two grams have come in at double the weight of our 80s Argentinian lightweights. And as we discussed earlier in the program, the compound creating the plastic for the 80s players was significantly lighter than that used in the 60s. So we're gonna do all the usual. We're gonna slide, we're gonna spin, we're gonna to listen to the different sounds the bases make. And irrespective of the differences, they look fantastic together on the pitch. So Argentina kicking from right to left as you look. An early opening. I've enjoyed these lightweights over the last two weeks. Now Brazil on the heavyweight bases. I often practice like this, not moving the opponents or the opposing goalkeeper, just pra uh, practicing the range and style of my passing. A 
Well, I think Smithy might have stopped that. Thought it had touched the defender here, but it hadn't. Now, Brazil spinning. You can always trust the heavyweights with a spin, but the lightweights, equally good. And they're sounding good too. Sliding beautifully. I really have underestimated lightweights of late. Big slide for Brazil. Look at that. Now one thing that will make a difference to the way that players behave is the pitch. On table one, we used a modern Spanish cotton striped pitch. This is the traditional green base pitch that came out in the sets of the 60s and the 70s. Now the players we have on here are both light. These are both coming in at a gram. We have Ajax playing on a lightweight base. We have Saint-Étienne playing on a topspin heavyweight base. A lovely finish on both sets of players and the upright cap-wearing keepers. This should be quite interesting. Right, Ajax this time kicking from left to right, the lightweights. This is the uh, way I normally like to kick. Oh dear, oh dear, need to work on that. Nice stop. This old Sabuta pitch works at a pace I'm far more used to. Forgive my arm. Ooh, nice bit of a lift on that. I know I'm repeating myself, but I have found a renewed regard for these lightweights. Oh, we're gonna walk it in. Yeah, a few touches too many for that one. Great spin from top spin. Nice near post finish. And look at that. The lightweights are spinning really well. Might as well finish that off. A slide. And from top spin, gorgeous. On table three, two more modern contenders. Top spin stay on the table, and it'll be the iconic early 70s German flag. Birmingham City away kit, one of my favourites. And they'll be up against Santiago's and Conitania. And uh, to our Italian viewers, sorry about the pronunciation. And they will be doing their demo on a Pegasus AstroTurf. Stunning away kit from Birmingham City, that's top spin. And again, two strips that look great, almost like evening sunset. Right. Birmingham City kicking left to right. Oh, that had a little bit of curve on it. He's overhit that slightly. Good finish though. There's that reverse spin, love it. Santiago players are good at that. But here you can hear they sound a bit light. I'm not that familiar with them. And I've overhit that as well. But they do everything really well. Again, Smithy would have had that. Now, I overhit this, I remember well. But another reverse spin. Beautifully controlled these players, both of them. Again, forgive my arm. See, this is another new pitch and my passing's falling a bit short. Not sure if it was in, but it is now. That's better. I hope you're still with me. This is table four, and as you can see, we have entered 
the old style Sabutio Stadium, which on a traditional Saturday would be my home pitch. Now the two teams we have on table four are from relatively new manufacturers and you'll be very familiar with them both. The whites are from Astrobase and from a rather attractive heavyweight traditional game set. And here you'll see when we take the lid off, the whites of course are already on the table. Alongside them, Arsenal with a rather attractive orange base, sturdy Zugo goals, and two balls, and beneath the tray, a pitch. Whereas their opponents are from Zugo, this is their take on the traditional heavyweight playing in the red and white hoops of Doncaster Rovers. Now, what makes this even more interesting is Enrico Tecchiati of Astrobase and the Parodi family behind Zugo worked very closely together in their early manufacturing days. So there are some similarities in the product range, which as you'll know, if you've watched previous programs, are always of a very high quality. Both teams got a lot of similarities, bases similar. Goals from Astro Base, I'll give the website details later. And again, two teams looking great on the pitch. So it's Astro Base kicking left to right. Now I've got no excuse as I play on this pitch a lot. Oh, that's quite nice. It's a nice cut, but Smithy would have stopped it. Both these teams behave really well. I've always been satisfied with Zugo. Astro Base are new to me, but I'm liking these. One shot to change the angle, and... Zugo sliding well. Good low drive. Tip over from an untouched goalkeeper. Nice slide. Oh, nice finish from Zugo as well. Had fun with these two teams. Another nice slide from Zugo. I've forgotten where this one goes. Too many touches. Normally I allow a defensive move. There we go. And blasted it between them. Finally, on table five, our more modern Subutio and Zugo mixed stadium. We have two of Subutio's underdogs. We have the Zombies. That'll be Liverpool playing their Merseyside rivals, Everton, who are on the moulded Walker bases. The players will be using the original 25 millimeter ball. They're on a Pegasus AstroTurf, a fairly new one at that. And the goals are from AstroBase. So Everton and the Walkers kicking left to right. Good start. So here are the Liverpool Zombies. As I mentioned last week, the Zombies do play well. It's a shame they look so lifeless. I'm not going to move the camera for you here. Now if I remember, I didn't want to mess this up as I kept you waiting. So go on low and hard as I remember. And the defender first. Oh no, he lifted it. It's a nice finish. Here's the walkers again. I've really fallen for these guys over the last two weeks. Really well balanced. Oh, I don't think that one went in. Here are the zombies spinning again. Nothing to move forward. I think we're going to see another one. They just are so comfortable to play with. And there's the walkers doing the same. Clearing the ball. They're worth trying if you've got a set. Lovely slide from the zombie and another one. Ooh, touched onto the bar. 
So what, if any conclusions, can we draw from having wandered around five different tables using eight different teams from the heavyweight and lightweight eras? Well, it all depends what you're looking for is the answer. If that had been a test of different player types, then we'd have needed a baseline and every test should have been performed on the same pitch with the same ball. Now, I wanted it to be more than that. Visually, it was more interesting. And certainly for me, it was more interesting to wander about and try all the different elements because it confirms a belief I've had for some years now. The player types, all of them, aren't that different. Fundamentally, the bases are a similar size. They are plastic. They have a weight in them. Yes, in my opinion, the heavyweight base performs better, but then I've used it for so long. Today, it was a pleasant surprise using the Santiago players. I'd never done that before. The little tight spins where you could reverse the direction of play were a joy with them. I was really pleasantly surprised. Now, I think, uh, well, in fact, I'm reminded of my school days. And if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'll make it quick. I was a very keen tennis player. And from the fourth year onwards, the school could enter you for a county competition. And in the fourth year, I got knocked out in the first round. In the fifth year, I got knocked out in the first round again, and I was getting the hump. And I was convinced it was because I didn't have the cool equipment. Now, being one of seven children, my parents didn't have a lot of money to throw around. But somehow, however they made it, they got me a lightweight metal tennis racket. This would have been towards the end of the 70s. In the lower sixth, the school entered me again. I had got my lightweight racket and what I managed to do with my own money, I bought a Bjorn Borg sweatband to go around my head, convinced it was the key difference. This would be the thing that would help me get through. Uh, and sure enough, in the first round, I lost again because the one thing I spent no real time on was improving my talent. And I think it's the same with table football. As a player, whatever age you are, if you can master the art of flicking your player straight, time after time, over different distances, without any real thought, so that it just becomes natural every time, he doesn't start rolling, he doesn't curl, he just slides straight and true. Then it's only going to take you a matter of seconds to adapt to using a different player type. The same with the spin. Spin is mainly about confidence. Your technique may be varied in the early days. Sometimes you'll get it just right. Sometimes you'll topple over. It's the nature of these style of players that they won't behave the same every time anyway. And I think one of the reasons the modern Fitzfer version of sliding Sabutio has evolved is because those players wanted everything to be predictable. So you have to accept with spinning, there will always be a degree of unpredictability. But once you've got that basic spin sorted, you can adapt to the playing types very quickly. And going around these different tables using the eight different player types has just confirmed that belief, in my opinion. But the other thing that became apparent was that the four things you clearly need for a game of tabletop football, you want to pitch, you want two goals, you definitely want two teams. But one of perhaps even the most important element is the ball. If your ball doesn't run true, or it isn't predictable, your game is ruined. If the ball is too light, yes, you can lift it, but it'll behave like a balloon. And equally, if it's too heavy, you'll need the power of a cannon to lift it. Now, thankfully for all of us, we have Trevor Spencer, a man who was at Sabutio Sports and Games from 81 to 1998. And in that time, with his colleagues, they developed an awful lot of products. But one of the things that he found most taxing, most challenging, and most interesting was developing the balls. Because when he joined the company, those balls hadn't evolved much since the early 25 millimeter days back in 1947. Well, this last week, Trevor has been unbelievably kind in talking me through that process, 
sharing diagrams, helping me with the science and how the developments occurred. And now I'm in a position, I'm very grateful to be able to share that with you. I hope you find it as interesting as I do. So in best carry on tradition, it's time to talk balls. I want to start off by admitting that when the idea of doing a piece on Subutio uh, footballs first came up, I was filled with trepidation. After all, Subutio is over 70 years old and there are an awful lot of them. I had no idea how we were going to make that visually interesting. I had a look on Peter Upton's Subutio website, which is a work of genius and I'd recommend it to everyone. But when you do read it, you'll see even he loses the will to live when it comes to discussing Subutio footballs. So what saved the day and the reason we're here is that after a conversation and some immense help from Trevor Spencer, he pointed out that really there are four key mileposts along the way over the last 70 years that really tell us all the key things we need to know. They are the 25 millimeter set F ball that came out with the first Subutio sets as we know them in around about 1948 and stuck around for years. Then there is the World Cup ball, a 19 millimeter ball with stickers on it. We'll look at that more closely in a minute. Then we have C121 from 1981, a printed ball that came out in the FIFA set. And finally, C205, for reasons that will become apparent, the most important of all Subutio balls, the Adidas Tango ball. So they are going to be our mileposts. We'll look at other balls in between just to prove relevant points. And we have a couple of nice experiments lined up to illustrate the topic as we go. So let's start with the set F ball. The ball weighs in at a gram. Right, we have a relatively simple challenge here. On the stripe pitch, this light green channel are the boundaries within which we'll accept a ball is rolling straight. But ideally, we're also going to try and hit this peg. Now to test the quality, the roundness of a ball, hitting it hard will allow it to roll straight for longer. So the first real test is to hit it more softly. And there we can see it starts to veer to my right. Let's go again. There we go. So we're not really getting a very good roll, even on a softer touch. Now all balls are made from two halves that are fused together one way or the other. Now for the first decades of Subutio, oh, that's gone straighter. That meant all the balls were glued. Now that creates its own problem because as well as having a seam, if the glue doesn't set cleanly and flush, it will hamper the ability for the ball to roll. See, that's not bad. And this is why I think the seam is playing some part in its failure to roll. Now on both of these balls, the seam is vertical. And as you can see on this one, it's not a very clean glued finish. That is going to have an effect on the clean roll of the ball. Here, although this ball is glossy and reflecting the light, you'll see the glue is rather messy here. Now, when we look on the orange ball, wow, even in this light, I can't see it. The seam is once again vertical, but it is a beautiful finish compared to the other two, really flush. And that is why we had a much better roll. The glue used was called trichoethylene and was applied by hand. I'd imagine those workers went home in the evening as high as a kite. And the idea was the glue was applied and then would evaporate at room temperature. But you can see from this rather messy finish here, this rather flawed finish, and this really smooth one, that we weren't getting consistent finishes. 
and without consistent finishes, you're not going to get a consistently good rolling ball. The final consideration is perfectly illustrated here. The brown and the white ball are two panel balls. One, two. Whereas the orange one is a three panel ball. Now the thing about the panels is not the numbers, bizarrely, it's how deep they are. With the white ball, you can just see how deep that groove is. Now that has an effect on the roll of the ball. Instead of having a smooth roll, it rather, it oscillates. There you see it. The orange one, with much shallower panels, rolls smoothly. The further we go into the history of Sabuto, the less this becomes a problem. But in these early 25mm F-set balls, the panel thickness could have a major bearing on the quality of the roll. Now I imagine there's hardly any of you even contemplating using 25mm balls in your play today. Those people who still prefer to play with flats and celluloid won't use anything else other than a set F ball. I play a lot uh, with Sabuto flats myself and the only way to play the game properly is with these size balls. But in the modern game they just aren't either consistent enough or tough enough. Then in 1969 C121 arrived, the tournament ball a 19 millimeter ball smaller than the set F brown ball, which was still glued by hand using trichoethylene. You'll see Sabutio were trying to emulate the iconic Adidas Telstar ball famously used in the Mexico 70 World Cup, based on the design of the 1962 Telstar satellite. The idea, by the way, for the pattern was to make the moving ball easier to see on black and white television. Right, let's put it to the test. I'm fairly convinced on my basic kitchen scales, this will not register a weight. There we go. So whereas the 25 millimetre F ball was a gram, this one doesn't register a weight. That's my left. Then to the right. So really, oh, not bad. Yeah, it depends. It depends whether or where the seam of the ball is. Oh, dearie, dearie me. Yes, we wouldn't want to be playing a game with one of these these days. Yeah, we're not going to get a straight roll out of that. Our next ball of interest is C183, the FIFA ball, which appeared in the FIFA box set in 1981. Now 18 millimeters in circumference. The unique thing about this ball and the reason it's in this batch we're testing is that it had on body printing. No more stickers. Each half of the ball, using tampo pad printing of the day, could only receive 120 degree coverage of the 180 degrees available. And here you'll see Trevor Spencer's diagram he sent to me during the week. But it was heavier, coming in at a gram. It was still glued, but the most advanced Sabutio ball yet. I'm pretty sure if I gave it a wallop, it would make it all the way to the skittle. Yeah. But not everything that you do in a Sabuto game is going to be hit with that kind of speed. But that's not bad. Yeah, the jury's out on this. It's a little bit inconsistent. Yep. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The more I get to know Trevor Spencer, the more I get to know Paul Lloyd, the more it becomes apparent just what an important year 1984 was. If you watched last week's programme, we were looking at the lightweight Sabucho players 
and particularly those that were machine painted and just what an improvement that made to the choice of kits and the detailing. Well, it was in 1984 that Trevor Spencer decided he wanted the new sharp sponsored Manchester United shirt in the collection. So he approached Old Trafford and had a word. And good news for all of us, Old Trafford not only said yes, they were thrilled and flattered to be involved with the world's biggest table football game. So 1984, we saw our first sponsored Sabutio shirt, a Manchester United sharp player, and it was an excellent job. So it was the same with Adidas. Trevor Spencer approached them because at that time, the Adidas Tango Ball was being seen everywhere in the real game. And Sabutio Sports and Games and Peter Adolf before them always, always wanted the tabletop game to be a real reflection of the real game. So the Adidas Tango Ball had to appear in the range. Now Adidas were the same as Manchester United. They were quite keen to have that chat. And who wouldn't? If you're a manufacturer of footballs, why don't you want to be on the world's biggest tabletop game, brainwashing the kids nice and early? But there was a problem. Adidas had one demand. They needed the ball to be printed all over. Now, as we saw on the FIFA ball, it just wasn't possible. The best you could hope for was that each half of the ball would get 120 degrees worth of printing. So that had to be solved and it was, but it took a lot of experimentation, a lot of patience and a lot of stubbornness on behalf of Trevor and his team. But eventually the Tampo pad painting solved it with a silicon pad. This is going to be a bad mime of a printing machine. So the ball was held solid and the silicon pad was flexible, carrying the print template. It moved to the ball and its flexibility meant it could surround the ball, apply the print and move away. Best of all, it gave nearly 180 degree coverage. We are looking, look at Trevor's uh, diagram here, at 175 to maybe 178 degrees. So Trevor, feeling buoyed, was faced with the prospect of meeting with Adidas and saying, chaps, what do you think? Well, the good news is they were thrilled. And when you see this ball close up, you'll see it is iconic in terms of the genealogy of Subutio balls up to its release in 1984. So we had all over print. Trevor managed to get the weight. He wanted the same weight as the FIFA ball. He managed to get that. So the question was, how did he seal the two halves together in a way that would guarantee a true role? And the answer came from somewhere like the Starship Enterprise because it was called sonic welding. <clears throat> the ball was held in position the two halves were cut in such a way that they just pretty much clipped together so they always met in the same place. That meant the thickness of the ball stayed consistent. A kind of pen top approached the ball and sonically welded it. Now if the thickness of the plastic all the way around the ball wasn't consistent, and again here's Trevor's notes where he puts it rather colourfully, the ball would explode. And let's face it, no one amongst us wants exploding balls. So we had all over printing, give or take. We had a beautifully made, very strong seal that left the, the seam really smooth. We had achieved the weight of the FIFA ball. Could this be the holy grail of tabletop footballs? It was 1984 the year that we saw sponsored Sabutio football kits and a football that rolled smooth as silk. Well, we're gonna take it retrospectively onto our table football monthly testing pitch. And it's only right and proper that instead of using the Brazilian heavyweight I've been using to test, we use the lightweight Manchester United player in his sharp kit. The first tango ball to be released was black and white, an orange one, came later, as indeed I believe did a yellow one. 
Right, I don't know why. I feel a mixture of nervous and excited about this. Here we go. <laughs> well, 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 look at that. Trevor Spencer, you are right. What a fabulous thing. I can remember using this ball in the 80s. I didn't know this story as I do now, but I remember thinking it was a cool ball. <laughs> Don't you just love it when you spend time telling a tale, building up, and when you get to the key finale. The ball does exactly what you've been told it will do. So once again, a genuine thank you to Trevor Spencer. There is no way I could have gathered this information together without his help, and I hope you'll agree, his rather splendid diagrams. Thanks, Trevor. Well, that just about wraps it up for this edition. It's been a bit Subutio heavy. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sure you'll let me know via the comments and the emails. Now, before we do disappear, I want to say again, a special thanks to Trevor Spencer and Paul Lloyd. Uh, that Subutio feature wouldn't have been possible without their incredible help and patience. The other thing I have to do is set you a question for this week's prize. Before I do, let me show you what you're going to win. You'll have seen it earlier in the episode. It is the Astro Base Heavyweight Traditional Game Set. Now this is a marvellous set featuring some really cool bits. There you have it. Two teams. You'll have seen the white team in the feature we did a little earlier. They play, move and look really fantastic. I'm not sure that this other team is Arsenal as they have a little orange stripe at the top, but they do look very nice sat on that orange base. Equally, if you watched our uh, feature on Subutio goals a few weeks back, these are very sturdy, one-piece plastic Zugo goals with nets, two reliable footballs, and beneath the tray, a nice smooth running pitch. Altogether, a prize worth having. So if you would like to get your hands on this very edition, then you'll be wondering what the question is. And I am quite proud of it. And I think you're going to enjoy it. I've decided against firing a question at you. What I'm gonna do is ask you the following. In front of me are five Subutio players in various strips, okay? So, starting from my right, which will be your left. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, it's vital you start here. One with blue, two, three, four, five. This week's quiz question is, what team will be number six? What team will be number six? Now, some of you may have cottoned on already. Some of you may need to have a think about it, in which case, just replay this section and have a think. Do enjoy it. Try and get your answer into me if you can over the next seven days. Uh, the usual thing, send it to this email address. Uh, don't send it anywhere else, don't put it on the comments. If you do uh, put it on the comments below the video, then I've got to delete it and that answer won't be entered into the draw. Okay, so teams one, two, three, four, five, which team will be number six? Right, that's it for this week, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for watching. I got the World Cup edition back in 72. Man, I was king of the hill. Those were the days. Had guys over and we played all day. I made the final, but I lost to nil. And those were the days. Let's set up and play Those and you